applications of um, methods that others have talked about. And I mean, based on this conference, I realized there are some things that we need to change or could be refined. A lot of this work is with the collaborator David Schmalley, who's in plant pathology at uh, Virginia Tech, and some other biologists working with him, Ben Ben Lin, AJ Crusson, let's help the projector less. Um, and then some uh, more modelers and computational folks like Amir Hozork Magam and Benindra Talapragada and <coughs> Just to motivate why we even want to um, talk about geophysical transport structures and ecology, there are, there, this is a, a notable case of an invasive species that came in on what we would all admit is a coherent structure, hopefully, a hurricane. This is Hurricane Ivan in 2004, and it took a pretty uh, a far south path for a hurricane. And it's believed to have picked up a new disease, new to the United States, from Colombia. Um, a disease that affects soybean and brought it to the Gulf Coast of, of the U.S. So these are the infected counties over here. It leads to, uh, if you have soybean, it leads to these kind of brown spots that plant pathologists call rust. Um, but if you consider the cost of all invasive organisms affecting the U.S. per year, not all coming in on the atmosphere, but sum them all up, it's over $100 billion per year in lost crops just in the U.S. alone. And we're talking about small things, so on the order of 10 to 100 microns that affect uh, staple crops like wheat, corn, uh, soybean. Soybean had been grown for decades in, in the U.S. without there being any kind of problem. More recently, there's a disease uh, affecting uh, citrus in Florida. So if you have any investments in Florida oranges, you might want to drop it. In fact, there's, there, there are big worries about that disease spreading to the California uh, orange groves. So there are concerns about uh, food supply and bioterrorism. You know, if somebody really wanted to, they could just do one of our calculations of where's the best place and best time to release a bunch of uh, disease and wipe out wheat. That would be a problem. We all like that. Um, there's also some interesting uh, uh, work looking at microbes, some of them related to plant pathogens, some of them just naturally occurring up otherwise, that uh, ride the atmosphere and catalyze rain. So they can they have an ice nucleating protein that can uh, cause rain to form. So in some sense, these guys can ride in clouds and then decide when they want to get deposited. Strange. And there are groups that are just beginning to look at that. Uh, especially there's a group of uh, Cindy Morris in France um, looking at one particular plant pathogen that they found. It, it's related to certain kinds of crops. And they found it in not only the crops, but the snow, the clouds, the rivers, the groundwater, it's in every part of the water cycle. And I think, to some extent, um, we can influence how much the microclimate, uh, uh, how, how rainy things are, just by controlling which plants we grow. So that's kind of interesting. You can rotate crops year by year and change the climate. So to focus on one particular microbe that our group has studied, these are fungal spores of the genus Fusarium. They are, they're found in dead debris, so the life cycle is kind of illustrated here, there's dead debris that produces spores, and it's kind of interesting, uh, this is a, um, a corn stalk, so if you have an idea of the size of corn, these are little black dots called parathesia, you zoom, on, zoom in on it, it's a structure like this that contains hundreds of spores, that when conditions are right, and it's unclear when conditions are right, those spores will be forcefully ejected at an acceleration of a million G. So this is uh, one of the highest accelerations in the biological world. There's now some fungal spore that's a little bit higher, like two million G. But uh, for all their trouble, this moves the spore just a few millimeters away from the, the plant surface. If they get picked up by currents, then they can um, travel to another susceptible plant. So they can get picked up uh, by currents within the, the plant canopy. If they get transported beyond the plant canopy, then they could move for uh, on the order of minutes, hours, or even days crossing oceans to affect some other susceptible uh, field. Um, they get deposited uh, by just actual natural um, 
down currents, but also rain, and they don't last forever. There's mortality by UV radiation. So that's mostly what limits the, uh, the flight times, if you will, for these microorganisms. And their deposition patterns can be patchy because rain can be patchy and wind is very patchy. And also susceptible to patients. We can detect these. So with a with my collaborator David Schmalley, uh, I don't know why I'm doing this. That's never a good sign. It says it's working. Maybe if I make it happier. Diego. I'm the last talk, so I have as long as I want, right? <laughs> Thank you. There's questions as well, huh? Working here. So there's petri dishes on essentially a model airplane, but we call them autonomous aerial vehicles. We can take them up to 40 meters or 400 meters altitude, and then open up the petri dishes, fly around for some appropriate sampling time, maybe 10 minutes, 30 minutes. We're trying to sample a large enough volume of air that we get something. Otherwise, we can just put up a big tower, but then uh, we don't we don't uh, sample this large volume. Plus, we can't go up that high. Open the petri dishes take them back down, analyze them in the lab, and you can figure out uh, what was in the atmosphere. So we can, for each flight, these are flight numbers down here, we can decompose what we sampled into numbers of spores, but also break it down by species. So if we just, if we ignore uh, the breakdown by species and just look at the total concentration, this is, a, in some sense, a nonlinear time axis. It's our sample number. But it actually represents 100 flights over several years. So conditions have to be right to fly. It's expensive to fly these things. Um, in fact, you need an FAA license to fly an actual airplane. Those are the new, uh, the new regulations. Now, what we're sampling um, are from <laughs> unknown sources. So that if we did have a, a disease field, there'd be some downwind plume. But we don't know what we're sampling. Right? We don't have the locations of, of uh, the source of disease. And as the winds change, the plume changes direction, at least many sources. So we're sampling from many sources. What I like to think is that uh, we're sampling a superposition of plumes from many distant sources. So think of invisible smoke plumes. Where, uh, instead of actual smoke, you can see we've got uh, plumes of, of microbes. This is an image from, uh, I think, wildfires that were in Siberia a year ago. But it's a good proxy to try to understand what's going on. We're sampling at some particular location. We're sampling from different sources. So as a function of time, we would have a, an evolving population structure as the winds change. So back to this, uh, this data set. How can we understand this? Let's just consider all the all the, the, the spores, we can um, we can determine that natural fluctuations here uh, are just due to this being a, a Poisson process. So the impact of these microbes on the petri dish is a Poisson process with a slowly varying intensity. So that gives rise to some 
natural variability on short time scales, but if we have large um, excursions or what the biologists call punctuated changes over short time scales, then that means that something else is going on. So here's an example. Uh, this is from 16th of September, 2006. This could be explained by just Poisson statistics, but uh, in this range of days here, we had very low numbers and then very high, very low again. So that would be what we call a, a, a punctuated change. So just to isolate out that, that particular event, we have a time series of concentrations. And we can, we can uh, define a, a punctuated change as, for example, um, something that has a probability of less than 1% of occurring due to Poisson statistics, or whichever criteria we want. This definitely qualifies. So how can we un understand um, this type of feature? So we're reviewing this as we're a cloud of high concentration is passing over our sampling location. And maybe we can un understand this as a filament. A filament of high concentration is passing over. So as it passes over a location, we have high values. And after it's gone, low values again. And what could give rise to this cloud structure? Well, if these microbes are airborne long enough, then maybe uh, they're being shaped by mixing happening in the atmosphere. So this is just a movie showing uh, forward and backward FTLE ridges. So they're just kind of candidate uh, true LCS uh, features, which we'd like to get into. Orange is repelling, blue is attracting, and this is over all of North America. You can see that. We can think of this as an atmosphere transport network that's uh, moving around a lot of material. And that was just a, a horizontal slice on a, uh, a pressure surface. If we look at several pressure surfaces and assume quasi-2D motion and then connect um, a lot of linear features, we can see what looks like a, a curtain moving across the landscape. Um, it would be better to do this in fully 3D Maybe Dan can help me with. <coughs> so like I said, we do quasi-2D on pressure surfaces. And eventually, we'd like to do fully 3D. The time scales that we're looking at is limited by the fungal spore variability, so 12 to 24 hours. We're using wind fields from NOAA to, to do all, all of these calculations. Um, I mean, what, we're, what we're thinking is that uh, these high concentration regions are within atoms of transport bounded by LCS, a little bit like the eddies that we've heard so much about this week, uh, transporting chlorophyll and also like warm water across the Atlantic. So this is an uh, artist's rendering of what it looks like near our, our sampling location, which is called Ketlin Farm, and uh, an LCS passing over. So when, we, when we're sampling, we're usually assuming that we are sampling on one side or the other of some significant and distinguished material surface. Is that actually the case? Well, if we look back at this particular day and use archive NOAA data, so this is past cast, of, um, when LCS were passing over our sampling location, we get them nicely partitioning this very high uh, uh, concentration sampling time. This is a geographic view. Uh, Virginia, our sampling location is the open circle, and the parcel we sample is the black circle. And it's nicely sandwiched in between two, uh, in this case, repelling LCS surfaces, which doesn't necessarily make sense to us. But we would have thought that things would kind of collect on attracting surfaces. But that's what we got. Well, they do seem to be influencing uh, the, uh, the temporal patterns and concentration we observed. In fact, after we did a statistical analysis and found that a punctuated change was associated with the LCS passage uh, over 70% of the time. So that means that <coughs> the LCS are structuring these airborne biological agent concentrations, but you can also think about it the other way. Airborne concentrations provide a proxy for measuring the Lagrangian transport structure. And there's tons of microbes up there. And the, the, the nice thing about it is they're geographically associated with the different areas. So you can actually determine, okay, the air we sampled, it's um, 
related to crops from Georgia or Florida. So we have some geographic information of uh, the source that we're collecting as well, even though we don't know the exact location of those diseases. So just to look at more detail, of it, we're sampling at one location. It's the star here. Um, and compute backward trajectories every hour for 24 hours. This is where they end up. We can also show this is a tracking uh, and repelling in CS. I forget which one. Passing over our sampling location, this would be a, a, a time history of FTLE at that location. So these two peaks here in time <coughs> correspond to two ridges in space passing over the location. And if you think of it in terms of the distance between adjacent points along a source line, then you know, those two peaks would give rise to the highest separation between parcels on either side. So if you sample on either side of, a, of an LCS, you're going to have um, be sampling air that came from widely separated regions. The fastest that we can do our sampling is essentially once per hour. So here's just illustrating that for the most dramatic case. Um, two parcels that were sampled, uh, one at 115, the other at 215. If you follow them backward in time, they have very different dates. Although there is some delay, right, because FTLE only tells you about how trajectories eventually separate. We probably get the most uh, dramatic features if we have separation occurring right at our sampling location. Right, if we're concerned about um, the effect of turbulence, and turbulence is significant in the atmosphere, so subgrid scale turbulence, here's a deterministic back trajectory that's going from uh, our sampling location and following it back in time. If we include turbulence, so this is using NOAA's models for turbulence, you can see there's quite a bit of scatter, and we're following, um, it's, it's very close to the centroid. Of the centroid of this distribution is very close to the deterministic trajectory. Here's an example showing uh, for our region of interest deterministic FTLE, and then if we include turbulent diffusion and just naively compute the FTLE, we get some smearing of these two features into one. That was just one realization. We can do an ensemble average. And uh, still, we don't, we don't see nice two features. We just have kind of one much coarser feature because the turbulence is effectively doing smoothing. Now, because we've seen, uh, comparing with historical data, this correlation between LCS and punctuated changes, this suggests to us that if we could forecast atmospheric LCS, this could be a way of forecasting if there are large changes in uh, spore concentration. And this could be useful for predicting the spread of disease, which is important for farmers and other people. But the, uh, the wind field errors that we, uh, uh, the wind field that we use has errors that are not small or localized in time. So this scale here is from negative 100 to 100 uh, meters per second in wind velocity. You can see sometimes there are very large regions of high error. So we can't just use previous robustness results. But we can use an ensemble uh, forecasting approach. So this is an ensemble average. We saw some of this before for the ocean from uh, Pierre. This is for the atmosphere. So this is an ensemble average for the same period of time I showed before. Standard deviation. So this tells you regions where you wouldn't trust the FTLE field. And we could still, using this ensemble approach, try to forecast an LCS passage time. And if we compare the forecast with the past cast, we can uh, see that we can correctly forecast within two hours, about 60% of the time, which isn't good enough to um, allow us to do sampling on a one hour resolution, but it's better than nothing. So this is just showing probability of an LCS passage, predicting up to 24 hours ahead of time. 
the time in which you would expect a passage. There's also been some speculation that these LCS related to temperature fronts. We haven't explored that at all, but that might be something that meteorologists are interested in. Our goal eventually is to uh, come up with some early warning system, and it's possible that an LCS or some other uh, transport method could help inform farmers at least about uh, possible zones of disease spread or, uh, as Josefina mentioned, maybe regions where you don't need to worry. That might be the easier thing to get into. I wanted to mention just some final thoughts uh, about Lagrangian transport and e ecology more generally. Uh, because I think as, as e ecologists move away from compartmental models to spatiotemporal data and models, um, the approaches that we've all talked about could be very useful. Um, some interesting things are the role of rare transport events and bifurcations when there's some <coughs> parameters changing due to climate change, for example. Can we come up with any universal principles for different fluid regimes? Oceans, rivers, lakes, atmosphere. In Arabic ecology, there are a lot of concerns. I, I get asked things like, uh, can you tell me where there's going to be a persistent barrier? Or can you tell me typical pathways? I think LCS type methods might be able to help there. Uh, there's also a um, big influence of desert dust. So this, these are satellite photographs. This is a model. Satellite uh, photos of desert coming off the Sahara and heading towards Florida and the interior of North America. Uh, also sometimes heading far enough north that it affects the UK. And this dust carries with it um, microbes. So it can affect the ecology of regions where this dust eventually lands. So it's estimated that it's about 180 tons of Sahara dust land in Florida. And uh, so this is a, a map of some typical connections between regions. And actually 60 tons of dust comes in North America from Asia. So we're right at the crossroads of these high, long dispersal uh, transport events connecting very widely separated ecosystems. So this could be another way that uh, in invasive species cross oceans. They just write these rare dust storm events. So being able to predict when there's going to be a significant dispersal and how far it would go, this could be of interest. Uh, looking at the oceans, this is previous work by Kerwin um, <coughs> and others in 2003. Uh, I think he claims it was the first comparison between chlorophyll and LCS type features. So this is chlorophyll transport in the Gulf of Mexico. You can see these are something like stable and unstable manifolds. And then chlorophyll in green, you see there's some, some correlation. So just as we can use um, airborne microbes as natural tracers, proxies for the Grangian transport in the atmosphere, you can use chlorophyll and other things that have been discussed this week as tracers in the, in the ocean. Some, some ecologists like to talk about connectivity, and connectivity between widely separated ecosystems. For example, this is uh, Southern California, and there are some islands off the coast, which if you live there sometimes you don't even realize that. They're so much smaller. Um, but this is the Southern California bite. This is showing the sea surface height. And Methods that have been applied by uh, Dave Siegel, uh, Cheryl Harrison, and, and others have uh, been to say discretize the coastline and the coast around each of the islands, and then uh, look at advection over 30 days and see what regions are connected. So we come up with a connectivity matrix, which to me sounds a lot like a transition matrix. And maybe there are some uh, methods that could be applied to learn more, uh, use some transfer operator approach or even graph theoretic approaches. Maybe there's some cycles that have not been picked up yet, maybe of interest to the ecological community. Also, I mean, if I could play this movie again, you may have seen their eddies, and they seem some of them move in and around the islands. So this suggests maybe a topological approach to understand mixing, mixing in this case by 
ghost rods, or the ghost rods are both the islands themselves that are fixed. I guess that will match one. And then the eddies moving around. If there's some seasonal ghost rods stirring around islands that leads to good nutrient mixing that's important for marine ecology, that's, that could be of interest. Um, forecasting sudden ecosystem changes. So this is uh, lifted from the paper by uh, Josefina and, and George looking at predicting the, the, the tiger tail instability in the Gulf of Mexico. But the same thing could be applied in the um, ecosystem context where possibly this could provide an early warning of rapid long distance dispersal events. So maybe this could be applied to sandstorms, um, other events where at least people can be on watch that material can travel very widely. So anything that's been released near where one of these saddle point analogs shows up um, could spread very rapidly or very far. So I'll just end with um, some papers that we've been working on. Some of the movies that I've listed are, are given are, are here at this website. I think I'm done right on time. So let's go. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Time for questions? Yeah. Sorry, with, with the dust bones and these hail and things, what sort of immediate reactions do you can spray? If you, if you know what's coming your way, let's say I, I know fungal uh, <coughs> spores are coming my way. I could spray <coughs> the fungicide. But that's an expensive decision. I don't want to do that if I don't have to. If the whole country sprays the pesticides. Hmm? If the whole country sprays, sprays the pesticides. But yeah, that's your expensive. Yeah. 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 yeah, this could be personalized to whatever your crop is. The idea is, uh, you know, a farmer could have an iPad, tells them, Gives them a color coded map as to whether or not he should spray. Yeah. Jake, I don't know if I've ever mentioned to you, but there's an interesting phenomenon of uh, it's thought that a pathogen comes from uh, Japan to Southern California and causes spikes in Kawasaki disease, uh, kind of a congenital disease. So um, it's maybe something, I don't know if you're aware of that, but it no. uh, might be a very interesting application. In that case, there's something obvious to do, right? So if, if these these kids are treated, then Kawasaki disease doesn't really influence them for life. But if they're not treated uh, right away, then it, it becomes a lifelong problem. These kids. So if you know it's coming, yeah. yeah so there's, there's changes in the atmosphere that they've correlated with um, these spikes in Kawasaki disease. So they're pretty confident, and, and they, I mean, Kawasaki disease has high prevalence there in Japan. Yeah. And it's named after Japanese, right? So yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I don't think anyone's looked at the exact transport uh, during these spikes. So it might be interesting to look at that transport during yeah, the spikes. Yeah. Yeah. Your FTLE movies, are those, yeah. those are sequential time windows? Yeah. I suppose. So, um, so yeah, as opposed to not like a material line uh, adapted. They're very close to material lines. Did you check, have you checked how, how porous they were? Did they act as good barriers or, or not? Um, we didn't check for that particular scenario, but uh, there's some leakage, but they're very close. Yeah. Yeah. You looked at the source localization problem. You mentioned that our sources are here to detect the source. So there's a lot of work in that, but can we exploit the use of knowledge of LCS to figure out really where? Um, no. Well I, well, I think at least our data set so far is poor. Right? We're at one location. So, but, but I'd be interested in other methods. Do you have a question? Jordan, go. <laughs> you mentioned the idea of having uh, permanent barriers because people would like to know where stuff doesn't go for sure, right? Um, in, in, say in the ocean when we see them, like the one that Josephina described, we can, as far as I know, the cases I know, in those cases you can trace it back to, to either some coast feature or a lot of cartography or something. So there's an, an Eulerian, if you will, root cause in the junk, right? Yeah. And we, we actually have a few papers in atmospheric uh, 
Fosius as well, and what, what we found in the rare cases when we could explain where they were coming from, in the case of, say, Hong Kong Airport, um, these things were due to vortices spinning off from mountain tops where you know, the wind was blowing. It was pretty predictable. So taking that further, don't you think that that one should actually take a look at the topography? This, there's no coast in your case. Yeah, but the there are mountains. Yeah, the mountains, right? And start looking for near those. So those would be the root causes. Obviously, this analysis still has a lot of merit because just because I have this peak here, I don't know what sort of structures it will generate. Yeah. Right? But at least kind of start looking there. Yeah. Would, would that make sense? Yeah, and they might, uh, you could say this is a, on average, it's a persistent barrier, but when are these rare yeah. transport events? And where could they possibly be along the barrier? Because in, in, in all honesty, that's the way, the only way I can imagine that a barrier is anyway anchored to a point in the atmosphere. Why yeah. is it not being blown away, right? There has to be something in the topography that keeps it there. Yeah. Okay, so we'll finish with you guys. So the uncertainty analysis part uh, sort of caught my eye. and. Um, but it seemed to be a little bit more structured than what I've seen. We've done some of these analyses. And so what happens is if, if you pass across, let's say, an epithelium bridge, an initial Gaussian distribution is going to do this. Yeah? It's just going to stretch in, along the ridge. And the distributions we were getting, as you say, the, you know, the, the mean, the Lagrangian mean would be somewhere in the middle. But the distribution itself got very convoluted around that middle. But maybe the difference is that, you know, shorter times and things like this. I, I think over long term, so two steps, but the uncertainty of the distribution, so if you, if, you, if you ride an underlying velocity field and you want uncertainty, that actually in itself depends on the coherent structures, like around your coherent structures in the flow, which is kind of a, you know, a conundrum. Mm -hmm. um, and the second, that these distributions can be very nasty. But I, maybe because of time integration, I didn't see them as very nasty. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll finish in again.